Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, my place. My name is Goody, co-founder, along with my son, of that cookie in the bag, that snack you didn't know you were waiting for. Goody's granola. Welcome to my place. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce you to someone that uh, I've known maybe 65 years ago. At least. Uh, living in Bayview, uh, he is, uh, has become a, a very successful dentist, and I'd like to introduce you to uh, a friend of mine, Mark Beanstock. Hello, Mark. Hi. Hi How Alan. are you, buddy? Nice okay. to see you, man. How have you been? I'm doing pretty good. Well, that's, what have you been doing with yourself? I know you're retired. <laughs> what have you been doing? Got any hobbies? Uh, actually, I have some hobbies. I'm not sure everybody would like some of my hobbies. But I've just taken up uh, shooting guns at at targets at a gun uh, um, a gun range. Oh, that's cool, man! What so kind of... I was introduced by somebody who said it's a nice bunch of people that get together and not, shoot each other, not for any evil doing, but just uh, <laughs> as, as a way of uh, you know practicing using the gun. One thing I would recommend, though. Don't argue with anybody. No, there's no arguing. Okay. <laughs> we don't even need bulletproof vests. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, I knew Mark. Uh, we lived, uh, we moved into a new housing development called Bayview Projects, which is uh, in Canarsie. And we all have different perceptions of Bayview. And the uh, uh, last we had here was a, a gentleman, Alan Adler, which I call the magic man uh -huh. with wood. Uh, and one of his things that he said was that there, his perception was that there was no mentors, there was no one to mm -hmm. teach you anything. And I want to get your outlook on growing up in Bayview. When did you move into well, Bayview? Well, I moved into Bayview in February 1955. I was just about to turn seven. Um, now, when I turned eight, I remember being in a third grade class. And the teacher asked us to write a composition based on what we wanted to do when we grew up. So I wrote that I wanted to be a dentist. And that desire never left me. So in terms of mentors, um, I don't think I needed any mentors because I already had a goal. And my goal was to be a dentist. There were family members that were dentists that were very successful. Um, who I looked up to, um, but so I didn't really need anybody within Bayview to encourage me, to push me along because I already had that goal set. See, one of the things though, he didn't touch, I'm talking about Alan, mm -hmm. and uh, you didn't touch is that in Bayview, most of the people that lived in Bayview, the uh, fathers were World War II veterans. Okay and they were low middle class and there was a huge family uh family connection connection okay and those were your mentors it was uh respect mm -hmm. we always called people older people by mister or ma'am uh, we held over open doors for people we gave uh, seats to people that uh, were older on the buses and subways but this was all an extension of the family. Those were our mentors, working hard, mm -hmm. uh, respecting people, and that's what he didn't touch on. Now, I understand what he's coming from, but there have been very successful people that came out of Bayview without having that those kind of mentors. And uh, just well, an example uh, is Howard Schultz uh -huh. from Starbucks. I mean, well, it's perfect when, when he was discussing mentors, I think he was discussing in terms of a career or a profession. Well, absolutely, you know, absolutely. You know, definitely there were mentors, and, and the times were different. Um, the, sorry to say, you know, I think people were more polite back then in the 50s and 60s. I, I think kids really um, uh, understood that the parents were the authorities, and you listen to the parents. If a policeman told you something, you listen to the police. Absolutely. So yeah. it, I don't think it was only in in Bayview. I think basically that was the attitude in general. But I think when he's talking about mentors, um, he he was 
primarily talking about um, things that are open to a person as a goal for a career. Well, that's exactly yeah. what he was talking okay. about. He was talking about people. Uh, you even brought up, um, I remember that you said there was no one to sh show you how to invest. There was no True. people that would, this is what you got to do with your money to invest in this thing. Uh, so he was basically uh, gearing mm. up towards that, right. where there was no one to show him that mm. there was a bigger world. He told me that he had to go outside in his teenage years mm. to find this bigger world. But growing up in Bayview was a great thing uh, for the most part. I mean, it was rough at times, but uh, thank God there was family mm. growing up there. And uh, Well, the, time, the times were different in terms of it was a lot safer. Uh, you didn't worry about being out at night. I used to go from one end of the project to the other, nine o'clock at night, never had a fear or a concern that, that I was gonna get hurt or anything like that. So I don't think it was just limited to Bayview, but that's where our experience was. Well, that's was. what we know, you know that's yeah. what we know. Like even uh, we had no air conditioner when we first moved in. And some people Ooh. put it Ooh. in there anyway, they stuck it behind the screen. But uh, so hot summer nights, I don't know if you remember, the parents oh. and kids would hang out right. 11, 12 o'clock at mm -hmm. night because it was just too hot in the apartment. But uh, anyway, I, I just want to get back into your thing here. Now, you had like a, a medical issue that you were talking well, about? Well, <clears throat> I remember in the eighth grade, no, not the eighth, I was eight years old, they had a screening in school for scoliosis which was basically a curvature of the spine. And they found out that I had uh, scoliosis. Um, and there's all, obviously there's all different degrees. Um, I don't know if it came from birth or it came from, I once fell down a flight of stairs when I was three years old and that could have kicked my, my spine into a wrong direction. So consequently, um, I probably would have been about four inches taller, and I probably um, would have a straighter back. But that never interfered with any of my activities at all. No, uh, I know. I, I know, did but... everything I ever wanted to do. Now, as a grown adult at the age of 73, it, it has affected my breathing to some degree. But in, other than that, it's never affected anything well, did they, they have, did you have any surgery for this thing? Unfortunately, or? surgery for this back in 19, I had surgery in 1967 to prevent it from getting worse. Um, but today they have surgery where they can actually straighten your spine. No kidding. Similarly wow. to when they straighten your teeth with orthodontics. Um, I was born a little bit too early because back in 1967, Spinal surgery was in the dark ages, so that was not available to me. Well, um, did you have any problems like uh, growing? I know you personally have overcome all this stuff in your head. Am I wrong? Where you know you just did whatever you wanted to do, mm -hmm. but socially, um, well, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I'm mm -hmm. talking about family. Uh -huh. I'm sure your family, the love and support, helped you through all of this stuff and, you know, gave you more confidence mm -hmm. and self-esteem with this stuff? Well, uh, my family was always very supportive. I had two wonderful parents and a wonderful sister. My sister was almost five years older than me. In many ways, she was, she was like a little mother. Uh, she used to, was very protective of me. Um, so socially, I probably, it, it affected, uh, my, it didn't really affect me till after puberty when girls became of interest and, uh, you know, when you're 15 and 16, 17, uh, you know, girls want that tall guy who is protective that it goes back to, um, <laughs> to the caveman time when you needed a man to protect you and he, he had a certain look, which was not the look that I um, threw out. So it only affected me. That I was able to do everything. I did everything I ever wanted to. So the only problem was 
that other people had problems with it. I never had problems with it. Well, that's fantastic. You, know? um, uh, uh, you have become a dentist, and it, nothing stops you from becoming a dentist. And I'd like to go... Uh, well, I wanted to be... My goal was at eight years old originally. Um, it, it As I was growing older, my goal to be a dentist was constantly reinforced. What was your inspiration for that? I can't tell you originally what it was because I really have no idea. But after that, when my parents found out that I wanted to be a dentist, uh, I, I saw the encouragement. They thought it was a wonderful thing. So I figured maybe in my young mind, if my parents uh, were so proud of the fact that I wanted to be it, um, I guess that's what fed fed the desire even more. Um, so I made it my point to do well in school because it was competitive getting into the schools. And luckily I had the, um, the grades to get in. Um, surprisingly enough, I got accepted to quite a few dental schools, but I didn't get accepted to the one I really wanted to go to. Which one was that? So I really wanted, I had my heart set on going to NYU. And I got a letter from NYU, a deferment. And I didn't understand why I got the deferment because I was accepted to Pennsylvania. I was accepted <clears throat> to Tufts University. So I made a point of not waiting to hear a re, uh, the final result. So I sent them a letter requesting a second interview. And uh, th this interview was not by a committee. It was uh, by the chairman of the admissions department himself. And to make a long story short, he said the committee decided they weren't sure that I could physically handle the program. Why? What, what was so well, different? Uh, NYU at that time, every department was on a different floor. So if you were going to do a, have a patient where you were going to do root canal, you would have to lug this 25-pound box of your instruments to the fifth floor. If the next patient you had to see needed surgery, you again had to lug this 25-pound box of your instruments to the 10th floor. <laughs> and this is how it was set up in those days. Now, everyone, if you go to NYU Dental School now, everyone gets their own operatory. You're on one, in one location, and you don't have to drag instruments anywhere. So you're telling me that because you had to take a 25-pound box to different floors, they didn't think you were capable of doing this? Um, I guess that's what uh, their reasoning was because they said they didn't think I was physically capable of handling the program. What's the end result for this? So the end result was we had a discussion, and then he said to me, I'll never forget Dr. Alex Dinan. He was the head of endodontics. He was the head of the, the admissions committee. He says, come with me. And he took me to the 10th floor, and he told the secretary right then and there, write out an acceptance letter. No kidding. And, wow. And I came home on the train flying as high as a kite because I never knew that that would be the result. And I ended up having... Um, what I wanted. So you graduated from NYU. So I graduated from NYU. I did a one-year residency in general practice, uh, which was not required at the time. You were able to just take your your boards and get licensed. Um, but the one-year residency gives you a lot of experience in a in a day-to-day -day setting, because everything that you learn in dental school. Just like everything you learn in medical school, it's not enough, really. You get your real experience. Uh, on the job training. On, yeah, yes. Yeah. And today now, because dentistry has expanded so much, there is so much more to know, so much more to do, um, that when Governor Pataki was governor, he made it mandatory. To, to do what? To have a one-year residency in, oh, a, okay. in a hospital setting. Uh, and then after that, I eventually, through um, different steps here and there, got into my own practice and was very happy for 45 years. That's very practicing cool. Practicing dentistry. Uh, what I want to uh, hit on you 
Mm -hmm. actually ask you is um, you bought someone's practice, am I correct? I bought into a practice. Into a practice, okay. Right. Now, you had to uh, meet the patients for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, people have a, uh, a concept or mm -hmm. a certain way that they feel people should be looking. That's like you see casting uh -huh. for pictures. Mm -hmm. A doctor should look this way, a dentist should look this way. When you first met patients, what was their initial reaction, whether it be negative or positive? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Uh, but I, I just think it would be interesting to talk about, um, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Um, I really can't really address that much because I don't remember really having uh, any negative reactions. If anything, I think I might have gotten more positive reactions because when I went into practice, I, I was so young looking that people must have thought that I was, uh, that I graduated younger or I skipped years. They might have thought I was a genius because uh, people have perceptions that the size of your body matches the size of your brain and it's such a ridiculous attitude. But I used to get what I thought were unwarranted compliments, um, which I didn't think were given to other people in my same capacity. But I really never got any overt negativity. You know, I will admit that if I'm looking for a doctor myself and I go through the internet, um, I might have some decision making based on the appearance. So that's my own bias. You know. Yeah, but most people are like that. And they're dead. They're yeah. with, that's with everything. Uh -huh. Whether it be you go to a uh, produce section and you see two <laughs> apples and uh -huh. one apple is a little bruised uh -huh. up. They might be both good, but you're going to take that one that looks better. Absolutely, but you know what they say, don't judge a book by its cover. Absolutely. And that goes to picking a professional or picking fruit off of a fruit stand. But people are human, yeah. and uh, it's hard to overcome yeah. that. But the, the, the ultimate proof is in the eating, and the ultimate proof is when in, you go to a doctor in, is, it, is the result of the treatment that you get. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter um, who you are or what you look like. If you're getting the result you want, that's that's the main issue. That's what so, you're there for. And you have a responsibility to develop your own reputation when it comes to uh, being in practice with anything. How many patients did you have? Do, do you remember well, even? I mean, the, the lists were, the, uh, the current, the lists that I would see within a year had to be in the thousands. But I used to see approximately um, 14 to 20 patients a day. No kidding. You know, some procedures would take five minutes and some procedures would take two hours. So it's not so much how many patients you see, it's what you're doing. Man, I go to a dentist and I still go to him and now he has uh, a few other people that mm -hmm. uh, work with him. But he was by himself. Okay. And he had all of these patients, and he would fly from one room to the other to the other. And uh, it's an amazing thing what he was doing. Was well, uh, health care in general has changed dramatically since 1975. Uh, there are more people that have, uh, that have insurance, more, more people than ever have dental insurance, and they can avail themselves of the treatment that they need. So it is, uh, you know, becoming uh, more and more common yeah, for... My guy with insurance, it's uh, Medicaid doesn't pay him enough. Right. This guy's not paying him enough. You got to pay this. Mm -hmm. You take it up with them. Uh, it's, to me, it, it's got a long way to go with dental insurance. It's, uh, it's crazy. And the amount of money that you have to put out if they don't accept the whole... And they want it up front, too. It's okay. not where... Like, I've been with this guy for 10, 15 years, and I said, can I pay this off? He goes, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. you got to pay me now. And uh, so they have this thing. Uh, care credit. Care credit. Well, care credit is something that definitely works. Uh, it's almost like having a Visa credit card. The only difference is that you don't pay any interest. No. But I will tell you, dentistry can be expensive. 
Um, the fees are not universal because it depends on other factors, the, the office location, wh whether the, uh, the dentist is paying rent or not rent, or if they own the building. And I will tell you also the cost of education uh, has really gone through the roof. My four years of dental school cost me a total of $10,000. That's like now, nothing today. Now, one year, one year course at NYU is over 90. Get out. So a person graduating from dental school today from NYU will have a tuition b balance of close to over a quarter of a million dollars. Well, then actually paying like a $150 for a cavity is cheap. Uh, true. <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah. When I first... When I first started out, you know, cavities were based on the number of surfaces of the tooth involved. It used to be $5 for a simple cavity. Yeah, no, he's charging me $150. But he's, you know what? He's giving me a senior discount of uh -huh. $25. Okay. Which is cool. He should give you a senior discount of 25%. That would be even better. I'm lucky I'm getting the $25. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, everything has gotten expensive and... Um, you know, one of the things that when they talk about putting a cap on health care, they never discuss tort reform. And with tort reform, I mean how much payout is gone for lawsuits. Oh, and, okay. you know, there are doctors, for instance, um, obstetricians, neurosurgeons, they're paying in the order of $200,000 a year. Just insurance. For insurance. Oh my God. So you imagine how much money do you have to take in just to pay your malpractice insurance and all the other expenses. So running a dental office is not uh, an inexpensive situation. Well, it's very you should expensive. be in the food business. I'm paying uh, uh -huh. for liability for goodies going on. Uh -huh. uh, we're paying about 300 bucks a month. But you can't, you know, you can't avoid your health care because... Um, well, we also have $2 million liability insurance. Okay. Okay, this is because uh -huh. of Whole Foods, they demanded that. I mean, my, my first year out of dental school, I paid $98 a year premium for malpractice. Now it's in, it's over 30000 A year? A year. Insane. It's just Which is insane. very low considering what other... Health specialists and pay. All of those costs are passed to the patients. It's like everything else. It's all passed to the patients. I know, the but patient. this is so much you can pass on to the patients. Well, you pass you know. on what you can. Uh -huh. I mean, what you can get away with is what you do. I mean, I'm not denying that being a, a, a good dentist provides you with a, a very good income, but it also costs you a lot of money to get to that point. You know, the education, setting up an office, um, and unfortunately, in some ways, it's healthcare has become a business. It's not, you know, where you can spend a lot of time with a patient as much as you used to. It's become more of a corporate entity. Well, that's like the dentist. He spends. He's so fast. You know, it's like uh, guy yeah. next, and all of this. It's like boom, boom, boom. It's it's uh, like assembly line dentistry. And he's pretty good, too. He's good. Well, he's as good. long as the result is good, I have no problem with it. But you don't, you, you, you don't have the time to sit and discuss things as much as you'd like. One thing I will give this guy, he'll sit and talk to you. You can ask him questions. Uh, you can see that he wants mm -hmm. to get to the next patient. Uh -huh. But he'll give, you, he'll give you time. I mean, it's, it's important for him mm -hmm. to uh, talk. Like, when you have your cleaning, he doesn't send one of his other... Dentists, is to mm -hmm. dentists, to come in and talk to you. He'll come in there, go over the X-rays, and tell you what you need. He'll, he'll well, give you that kind of time. Uh, besides doing the practical treatment, I I always try to be an educator to the patients. Um, I think information needs to be uh, given. There are so many people that don't have a clue about what's going on inside their mouth and uh, the things that they need to do to take care of it. Uh, many many illnesses show up in the mouth and we are the first to diagnose different no conditions kidding. and unfortunately there are things that people let go that cause conditions 
you know, in, infected gums can cause problems to your heart. Uh, if you can't eat effectively, you're not going to get proper nutrition. So it's your mouth and your teeth is a part of your body, and you have to look at that as as a holistic form of care, where you're just not treating teeth, you're treating a person. This is what uh, my dentist actually tells mm -hmm. you. You know, flossing and uh, brushing and mm -hmm. uh, whatever. But uh, well, that's I don't important. floss as much as I should. Mm -hmm. uh, I do brush every day. And I am also happy to say, going back to growing up in Bayview, a lot of dentists grew up and went to dental school and medical school, and we all came from the city housing project. Very cool. So um, you should not let the word project interfere with your goals? Well, uh, my mom said don't ever use the word project. Use mm -hmm. the word housing development. True. Well, you, you can. Know? Well, well, project, when you say project, what do you think of? You think of crime, you think of low income, you think of all the dreads. That's the, uh -huh. And it might not be that way, but it's no. perception. It's that word. Well, it's a project. My mother used to say attitude is everything. And I believe very strongly you should never let somebody else dictate to you what you can do in life and what you can become in life. If you have a goal, you have to stick with it and go as far as you can with it without letting anybody... Well, let me tell you something. You're a perfect example. I'm very serious and I'm like really proud mm -hmm. of what you've done. I think you've done a great mm -hmm. job. Overcoming, what do you say, your medical issues? issues. Uh, but what I want to do is listen. This has been a very interesting conversation mm -hmm. I've had with you, Mark, uh -huh. and it's it's a pleasure. Yeah, it took um, it took over sixty five years to have a real sit down conversation. Well, how did we connect? We yeah. connect. We connected on uh -huh. Facebook, and I also bumped into you in a uh, a Whole Foods. Store. Well, you actually came to look for yeah, me. Yeah, right. I, that was, I think, in Manhasset. Right. Yes, I remember. How was uh, Gail, by the way? Gail's doing good. Yeah, she's, she's uh, feeling okay. Looking forward for the beach club. Okay, and that's good. Always, and uh, you know, I always, at this stage of my life, I need things to look forward to. So I'm looking forward for the beach club. I'm looking forward to getting to Normandy and uh, the Viking Riverboat Cruise. And. Um, you know, those are the things on my list to see the rest of the world. Yes, but you did reach out and came and visited me, and, uh, I, and I appreciated that. And uh, we've basically been friends because uh, we, it's like Alan Adler. I knew Alan, uh -huh. but I didn't know him. I knew him. I know, Absolutely. I know him now. And by the like way, I know where, him. where were you in, in 2017 when we had a, a big high school reunion? Um, 50th year. Sorry you missed it. I was here, but I really didn't know if I... I never went to school. I had um, I had a, uh, a disorder. Well, one, of your, one of your other friends was there, Alan Steinberg. Well, you know what it is? I had a reading disorder. I didn't know until uh, I was in my 40s that I have dyslexia. And I was a terrible student, uh -huh. and no one could figure it out. I was smart, but I was lazy. And my parents were up to school more than I was. And we finally found out in my 40s because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. That's like when I went to you know, Jewish school. Mm -hmm. They're teaching me Hebrew, and I couldn't <clears> read English. And there I'm looking at uh -huh. Olive, Bays, Gimel, Don. I don't know what the fuck I was doing. Did talking you know about. that there was a reunion in the making, or you, or you didn't even know about it? I knew, but I really uh -huh. didn't know anybody. Uh -huh. You know, and it's, uh, I didn't have a great high school Experience. time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was high most of the time. And, <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, I'm just telling you where it's at. Yeah. I mean, and uh -huh. that's when I went to school in uh, Iowa, mm -hmm. and I found theater, and uh, it was like getting a fresh start. What made you pick that school? I had no choice. Oh. I had a. I was a terrible student, and I so went. You to went so you went where they would take you. Well, I went. I actually went to uh, New Hampshire, a place called Nathaniel Hawthorne, for one year. Mm -hmm. And I needed a 2.5 average to go into my sophomore year, and okay. I ended up with a, a 2.3 average. So they told ah. me, you know, goodbye. So I went to, uh, my dad took me up to uh, Massachusetts, and uh, they said, where do you want to go? I said, I'd like to go to California. And they said, well, they won't touch you with a 10-foot <laughs> pole. Ten pole. Mm -hmm. You're going to Lamar's, Iowa, Westmore College, wow. W-E-S-T-M-A-R. And he said, go find Iowa on the map. And I didn't even know where the hell it was, but it was a, a Methodist school, mm. uh, fifteen or seventeen hundred people, 
Uh, I hung out with mostly with the Black Student Union, uh-huh. and uh, I was uh, basically one of the only Jewish guys there. And people actually thought that I had a, a tail and a, a horns on there. And uh, the town that I lived in that time was what they call a sundown town. Uh-huh. You know what a sundown no. town? Sundown town is if you're a person of color, you got to get out of town or else you're going oh to jail. God. It's called a sundown town. And that was in the 70s? This was in the 60s. Wow. 60s and then I graduated, finished in 72. We got all of that changed. I mean, it was, uh, we had a terrific uh, uh-huh. revolution. Anyway, uh, I can go on for a long time, oh, but this was a great There's thing. so much to talk about. And uh, I want to thank you. Well, the last thing I want you to do, my magic wall here, I oh, want you to don't. sign my wall. Sure. And we're going to do that in a minute, mm-hmm. but. Uh, Absolutely. Go see the dentist. All right.